So we get to begin a new sermon series, which doesn't happen that much around here because I tend to preach entirely through or most of the way through an an entire book of the Bible these days. And that makes uh, the marketing minded among us crazy because it's, you know, they tell you in these planning church um, things that you need to do four and five week sermon series that you can really sell and get out there and market. And I think that's a great idea if we could just figure out how to make one big sermon series into like a bunch of sermon series, then we could do that. But um, we are actually technically moving into a new book of the Bible. We're going into the Gospel of Matthew, the very first book in the New Testament. And we're coming out of a time that we've been in the Old Testament, the very first book in the Old Testament, Genesis. And so even though we're entering into a new series, I don't want you to think that we've left something and we're going into something else. As a matter of fact, the way the Gospel of Matthew begins is kind of to begin where we ended in Genesis. If you go just a little bit further in Genesis, um, you see that the three sons of Noah, which is where we kind of ended up last time, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they began to have children and families, and they created kind of this ancestry. And through time, Shem, who it was prophesied by Noah, God would be Yahweh, the Lord, Jesus. Um, He had a son named Abraham, and it was through Abraham that we have the 12 patriarchs, including uh, the one Judah from which came uh, King David, and out of King David, create, he created the royal line that led us all the way to Christ. So really, there's just, we're just kind of continuing to go, and we've kind of fast forward in the story, to, story a little bit to see how God would reconcile the world to himself and bring his family back together. These three sons created a family that became families, that became a nation, that became nations, And now through Christ in the gospel, uh, we have God's endeavor to reintegrate the nations and bring them back together under his lordship. So it really is um, quite connected. The the gospel of Matthew is the most Jewish of all the gospels. For those of you who've been here some time, we did the entire gospel of John. And of course, John was a Jewish guy and he was an apostle. And so there were many Jewish themes in there. But John wrote for a worldwide audience, whereas Matthew specifically was writing for the Jewish people. Now, that means that this is going to be um, about the same, but in some ways a lot richer and deeper. Because the gospel, though it is for the Jews, it is first for, I mean, for the Gentiles, it is first for the Jews. And and to come to Christ is to come to uh, faith in the true Jewish religion or the true Jewish faith. He is the Jewish Messiah, which means he is the Jewish Savior and King, who also through them reaches all of us and brings us into his kingdom as well. Uh, I read a great story about a week ago about the fastest, this is really cool, the fastest growing church in the world. And the fastest growing church in the world is an underground church, and it is in the country or the nation that is Iran. The fastest growing church in the world is in, is in Iran. Iran hates the Jews and hates Israel. And yet the fastest growing church in the world is in Iran. And, and, and it is almost entirely led, by the way, by women because they can't get any men to do it. So it's the fastest growing church in the world led by women. And their number one, the number one thing they espouse is faith in what they would say themselves, not in just in Jesus, but in the Jewish Messiah. And and what the word they're trying to get out to the world from their underground status, which is incredibly dangerous to be saying these things in the nation of Iran, what courageous women, what a courageous church this is, the message they're trying to get out is that we don't hate the Jews, we love the Jews, we understand it is through the Jews that we have been reconciled. So as we leave the Old Testament and we move into the New Testament, the best place to begin is not just at the first book, but the first book, which is the Jewish gospel, which attempts um, so heartily to connect the present with the past. Uh, Matthew was very much trying to show his audience, to speak to his Jewish audience, and to show them that Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of the Messiah, that his coming actually works perfectly with the prophecies of the Old Testament, even though uh, many times they were misinterpreted. 
And so people missed his coming. He was being very careful to make that clear. Now, the good news of the gospel is that the kingdom of heaven is near and even that the kingdom of heaven is here. When you read at the beginning of the gospels about the ministry of John the Baptist, you read that he went out and his major message was that the kingdom of heaven is near. Come and be baptized, cleanse your conscience, get yourself sensitive to uh, the presence of God, make sure that you've washed yourself of your sins so that when the Messiah comes, when the kingdom draws near, you don't miss it. That was his ministry, to prepare people's hearts not to miss the coming of the Messiah because it wasn't going to come in the way they thought it was going to come with, with brilliance and pomp and circumstance, with, with big politics and a military. It was going to come in the form of a humble servant. And he's like, you don't want to miss this. You're going to have to have spiritual eyes to see and the ability to perceive. And so he did this ministry in advance of the coming of Jesus. And then Jesus kind of took over from John because it was his ministry. And he began to preach around the same theme. Uh, I got good news. Prepare yourself for it. The kingdom of heaven is near. And then he even began to show that the kingdom of heaven was already here. Because the king, the Messiah, the savior in the Lord was present and it was him. Now, when you and I hear the kingdom of heaven is near, when the kingdom of heaven is here, we hear it uh, in one way, which is not a bad way. But when a Jewish person heard that, they heard that the, the theocracy that is Israel was going to be reestablished and made dominant upon the world again. And that this kingdom would rule and reign not over just over the Middle East, but over the entire world. And its leader, the Messiah, this somewhat human yet seemingly divine person that, that, that was a mystery to them, um, would sit on the throne of David and would rule and reign over it um, for eternity. That was some sense of the notion of what was going to happen. And so when these prophets and then Jesus came and began to say this, uh, they heard it with a lot different ears than you and I do. Now, Matthew is a, is a great gospel, but it starts in a way that is probably inauspicious for most of us because it begins with a genealogy. And, and we tend to, and even I as a pastor, I tend to skip genealogies, not because they're not important. It's just really difficult in the brief amount of time I have preaching to explain to you why they are so important. As a matter of fact, when we were at Genesis chapter 10 and we went through the ancestry of the three sons of Noah, which is very, very important, um, I skipped it because I was like, that's a long chapter and a bunch of names that I'm going to mispronounce and eyes are going to roll back in their heads and they're, they're not going to get it. So I just kind of briefed you on it. And we moved on to the next chapter. Well, we're not going to do that today for two reasons. The first reason is it is incredibly important. And there's some cool stuff in here that I want to pull up, pull out that I think will be very edifying to us all. The second reason is I really just don't have the guts. If I'm going to preach a book of the Bible in the New Testament, if the first 14 verses are a genealogy, then I figure I better read it and, and, and somewhat explain it. Now, remember the significance for the Jewish people, and it's significant for us too. We just don't naturally understand that. The, the significance for the Jewish people was um, that he was showing them that the Messiah came and fulfilled the prophecy that he would come through the royal line of David and ultimately, in some sense, eventually one day sit upon his throne. And so he went right to work through the genealogies of the Old Testament to bring them to the present day and show that Jesus was a fulfillment of that prophecy. So he begins his gospel like this. He said, this is the genealogy, the origin of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In other words, before I go in and tell you about his life, his teaching, his miracles, his power, his death, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, before I give you the whole story, I want, you, I want to make sure you understand the gravity of who this man is. I want you to know that he is a fulfillment of the prophecy uh, of the Messiah. And all throughout the gospel, that will be proven. But he specifically begins with this genealogy because what they understood well and correctly is that he would come through the line of David. It goes on to say, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Now, going back into Genesis, remember the three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem, ultimately, through his ancestry, came Abraham. Abraham was the first one in the Bible who was circumcised, 
which began a, a more precise covenant with God than the covenant that Noah had. And it was through Abraham that we ultimately had Isaac. And Isaac, that, as we read here, who had Jacob. And Jacob, who had 12 sons that became the 12 tribes of Israel. So Abraham is an important character in this. But remember, this graphs all the way back to the very beginning. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and the 11 other tribes. Judah is being enumerated here because Judah is the tribe that David would come through that would ultimately be the royal line that would lead to the throne that the Messiah would sit on. So the father of Judah and his 12 brothers, 11 brothers, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, this, this part gets good. This is, there's some scandal in the genealogy, and I want to pull it out because it's really cool. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now, that's a story we're going to get into in a minute, but hold on to that thought because there are, like, there are five women mentioned in this genealogy, only five women among many, many men, and all of them are interesting. Now, Mary, we understand, is the fifth, and we know why she would be mentioned, but these other four are, are quite, um, it's quite curious that he included them and no other women because all four of them are Gentiles, and all four of them come from somewhat of a scandalous past. So hold on to that. I don't know what it is about Jesus and women with a scandalous past, but he always drew near to them and he always honored them, probably because that is like, that's like a symbol of the church. We are the bride of Christ with a scandalous past that God for some reason mysteriously loved and brought near to him and glorified himself through us. But anyway, that was Tamar. Now, Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amenadab, Amenadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, yet another one, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, yet another one, and Obed the father of Jesse. And of course, it was Jesse who would ultimately be the father of David. Now, let's stop for a minute, and let's talk about three of these women. The first is Tamar. Now, Judah was the son of Jacob through whom the line would come, the royal line would come that would include David and lead all the way to the Messiah. So that's the one that we're focused on in this genealogy today. Judah left uh, the, his, his home folk and went out of town and decided to start his family among the Canaanites. And he married a Can Canaanite woman. Now, remember the Canaanites... Uh, they are ancestors, or they came. They are descendants of, of Ham, and remember, Ham was cursed through his son Canaan, and so here we have one of the sons, so to speak, of Shem marrying um, one of the daughters of Ham, and so already we're a little confused because Shem was the good guy, Ham was the bad guy, and yet here we have Judah, um, this prominent tribe in Israel. Uh, and he goes out, and he lives among the Canaanites, and he takes a Canaanite wife. And so his firstborn son was a guy named Ur. And he found a wife for Ur who was a Canaanite woman. That was Tamar. Now hold on to this. This is going to get good. Now Ur, it says, was wicked. And so God put him to death. There's no other explanation. He's just He was alive, and then he was dead, and he didn't have time to get his wife pregnant. So the Jewish custom was for the next brother to marry uh, his brother's wife and for the son that was born, that firstborn son from that relationship would actually be counted as his older brother's wife to keep his line and his inheritance going. You, you with me? You following me? So there's this woman Married to, this Canaan, uh, married to this Jewish guy. She was a Canaanite, but became Jewish through conversion through the marriage, right? That's the way it is to this day. If you're going to marry a Jewish girl, you better get ready to be Jewish because that's just the way it's going to be. If you're going to marry a Jewish guy, you definitely better be ready to become Jewish in some fashion or form. So that's kind of what happened. So then the brother came in after he died, and it was his job to get her pregnant so that there would be a namesake for the brother to continue the line, which in this case was important because this was the continuation of the royal line that would ultimately lead to David and ultimately lead to Jesus. So the second brother came in, and he decided he didn't like that. He didn't want to get his brother's uh, widow pregnant 
only to have the child actually be his child, his inheritance, even after he's dead, rather than his. And so the Bible said, and I'm going to be as delicate as I can with this because I recognize this is a family group, that, that he would sleep with her, but he wouldn't allow conception. And you can just read the Bible if you want to know the details or use your imagination, but he, you know, he, he went for the fun, but he didn't care about the responsibility. Well, the Lord looked down upon this, and he decided that this too was wicked, so he put him to death as well. So the father-in-law, Judah, says to his daughter-in-law, who is now widowed two boys, uh, I tell you what, live as a widow for a little while, and when my younger son grows up, I'll give you to him, and then we'll continue your line from there. Except that he forgot about her. I know you think I'm going a long way around, but this is so cool. He forgot about her, and many years later, after his wife, her name was Shua, after his wife died, that is, Judah, the the father's wife, died, uh, he went on a business trip. And Tamar, his Canaanite daughter-in-law, was so upset that he had never found um, her a husband, had never kept his promise to get them connected so that they could continue the royal line, right, that would ultimately lead to David, what she did is she dressed up like a prostitute and went to where he was and somehow made herself available and he purchased an evening with her and without knowing it, got her pregnant with twins, which is Perez and Zara, through which the royal line continued. So a Canaanite, a Gentile woman who scandalized herself by dressing up as a prostitute, selling herself to her father-in-law, real Jerry Springer, Alabama, Mississippi stuff here, (laughs) has a baby, and somehow, I mean, the writer of Matthew beautifully, I mean, Matthew was brilliant. He actually wants us to have this conversation thousands of years later and talk about it, and the reason I know that is he put it right in there. He could have easily brushed over this. But he wanted us to see um, how messy and human and scandalous and broken the whole story is. Well, that's the story of Tamar. That's probably one of the craziest ones. Uh, The next one, if we move on down, is Rahab. Rahab herself was also a Canaanite woman, and she lived in Jericho. And after they crossed the Jordan and went into the Promised Land, one of the first uh, battles the Hebrew people had among the people who existed there were the people in Jericho. And Rahab was a prostitute in the city of Jericho. And when the spies went in to spy the place out before the siege, she hid them and she protected them and she let them go. Therefore, when they sieged the city, they spared her life. And then after the city was destroyed, she became Jewish herself. So um, we have a second prostitute in the group. If we move on to Ruth, R- Ruth was a Moabite, which was also a Gentile, not a Jewish person, who married a Jewish guy who died and then went with her mother-in-law, who was Jewish, back into Israel, and of course married Bo- Boaz. Now there's no scandal in her life, but her entire family was born out of scandal because her um, great ancestor was Lot. And and Lot, um, he was the cousin of Abraham, right? And Lot had a couple of daughters, and the one older daughter couldn't find a husband. And so what she did is she actually got her dad pregnant, I mean pregnant, got her dad drunk one night, went and in his unconsciousness had uh, slept with him, as the Bible would say, and had a baby. And then the younger sister did it the next day, but it was it was actually through that older sister and the son that they had together that we have the that was Moab and we have all the Moabites so scandal all over the place and that was hard to explain so I hope you appreciate it but those are the three women that are mentioned and then then we have the fourth which is of course is Bathsheba and there's all kinds of scandal around that as well so continuing I'm going to pick up on verse five and move right into verse six Uh, Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon. And I love the way he puts this. Whose mother had been Uriah's wife. 
In other words, even though David ultimately married Bathsheba, legitimately had the son Solomon, we know that that relationship began in adultery, and David ultimately um, caused her husband to be killed, was guilty of murder to cover it up. And by the way, oh, in case you wanted to know, uh, she was a Hittite, which was a Gentile as well. So you have this whole genealogy, and we're going to move through it quick in a minute. We're going to close with communion. But you have this whole genealogy, and it is very curious to me that only five women are mentioned. Of course, mentioning Mary makes complete sense. The other four don't make any sense, but it's as if Matthew, being as brilliant as he was, wanted to make it clear to his audience, his Jewish audience, and through time, even our audience, that within this royal line, within this pedigree, there was not perfection. And all throughout, broken and imperfect people were being propped up and used by God to fulfill this prophecy and to keep this hope alive. And the inclusion of these scandalous Gentile women is, is to me, a symbol and an insertion of the truth that broken, scandalous, Gentile men and women, including you and I, would one day be grafted in to the royal line as well. Matthew knew well what he was doing. He played the film through to the end. He knew where things would end. Actually, he had already, when he began to write the gospel, heard what Jesus said at the end of the gospel, which is to go and make disciples of all nations. He knew that the power and the effect of the Jewish Messiah and his ministry on earth would go to all nations, that he was bringing the entire family home. He also knew that the Jewish people, like all people, were prejudiced. They were even racist, you might say. They had a superiority complex, and they could not imagine that salvation would come to the nations. But he showed them in their history how even the most cursed Canaanites were being grafted back in to God's family because one day they would have to understand that, that we, along with they, were being made heirs and joint heirs through Christ in the kingdom of heaven, which was coming near and was even, was even here. Okay. So Jesse was the father of King David, and David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Now, a lot of people would ask the question, why was, it the, why was the line of Jew, Judah um, chosen for the royal line? Why was King David made so prominent in this? That's very simple. King David was a man after God's own heart. King David, on his best day, was the best human version of what Christ would epitomize. It wasn't, the, it wasn't that David lived up to and, and was the perfect illustration of Christ, but he was an illustration of what Christ would be like. And the greatness of David came through the fact that he loved God, he knew the heart of God, and he submitted to the heart of God. In other words, his greatness came not through ambition, but through submission. And, and that would be exactly what you would say about Jesus. He did nothing except what his father told him to do, what he saw his father doing. He did nothing for his own glory. He put it all back upon the Father, even though he was equal to the Father, being the Son of God, the one and only Son of God, he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. He showed his greatness in submission to the will of the Father. He aligned himself to that. He's a prototype of that and a prototype of all who would ultimately follow him one day. It was King David who said, everything in the heavens and earth are yours, O Lord, O Yahweh. And this is your kingdom. And even as this great and powerful king that seemed to have all kinds of devices at his right hand, he basically said that you control everything, Father. You, it is at your discretion that men are made great and given strength. Your hand controls power and might. Like It all comes from you. In, in submission to you, I'm being made great. That's why David was used that is the prototype. That was David on his best day, and it wasn't that David always had a best day. He had a lot of bad days, but David on his best day was the prelude or the vision that we would ultimately have for the Messiah and how he would live out um, all of his days. Okay, so David's son was Solomon, and Solomon was the father of Reboam, and Reboam was the father of Abijah. Abijah was the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of of Jerome, Jerome the father of Uzziah, Uzziah the father of Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz, 
and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. I hope you all, I hope you all got that. And those were all the kings uh, that, that led us up to Hezekiah. And then Hezekiah would lead us to the point of the time um, of the Babylonian exile. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. That's when King Nebuchadnezzar came and he sieged Israel and he blew it to pieces and he carried most of the people off into captivity back to to Babylon to be his slaves or to be his workers, to be uh, in some form in his government, right? So he didn't absolutely destroy him, but he he carried them um, back with him and it completely diminished the nation. And so the formality of the kingship changed. Instead of these, uh, these men that came after, um, after him being actual kings, they were more like ceremonial kings that kind of stood in place in submission to the king of Babylon. But they were there. They were placeholders. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Sheltiel. Sheltiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihu. Abihu, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, and Achim, the father of Elihud. And if you think I didn't practice these, you're crazy. I practice them <laughs> night and day. And I decided even if I'm saying it wrong, I'm going to say it like I know what I'm talking about. And I'm going to assume that you guys don't, don't know any better. Elihud was the father of Eliezer. And here we go. It starts getting interesting again. Eliezer, the father of Mathen, Mathen, the father of Jacob. And Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary, this is the fifth woman mentioned, and good woman, nothing scandalous there, the Virgin Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So he lays out the entire genealogy. He lays out the entire line all the way from Abraham up until Jacob, up until Joseph. And then from here, where we, where we will begin next week, he begins to explain this extraordinary birth and inclusion, this imputation, if you will, of Jesus into the royal line. Now, notice the language here. It does not say, it will not say that Joseph is the father of Jesus because Joseph is not the father of Jesus. Joseph is the stepfather of Jesus. Joseph is uh, the one through whom the line opens and Jesus is placed there. I mean, Jesus is literally delivered to the doorstep of Joseph who's next in the royal line, just as the prophecy said he would be, but it makes it very, very clear that he is not the son of Joseph. But he is the son of Mary because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit with the Father, Father God, as his father, spiritual, And Mary, a very normal, a good Mary, not a scandalous Mary, as his mother, the perfect human sacrifice, the Savior who is not only God, but is man, Emmanuel, God with us, the perfect human sacrifice, the perfect human being, the one who fulfills the prophecies perfectly and makes clear the confusion all throughout the Old Testament as to whether this man would be uh, from God or actually a God himself. You could say that Jesus is the human face of God. He is the exact representation, the Bible says, of the Father's being. He is the, he is the radiance of the Father's glory. And so he's doing the work here to his audience that would have been quite familiar with all of this, even though we're not quite familiar with all of this. And he's showing how this prophecy can be kept that is ancient and thousands of years old perfectly through the coming of Jesus. But he's also kind of letting his audience know all those prophecies you've been reading, all those prophecies you've been interpreting, all those prophecies you've been trying to understand, you can't fully understand them until um, you come to Christ. Because now he's going to begin to teach from the Old Testament as the apostles continue to teach from the Old Testament in such a way as to bring fully into light what it was speaking about all those years in advance. It was cryptic. It was hard to understand. It was hard to imagine. They would have part of it, but they didn't have all of it. And they had to be very, very careful because though the prophecies were true, though the word of God was true, their interpretations were lacking. And isn't that the case 
all the way up into this very day. When we misinterpret scripture, when we have a half truth, we ultimately find that we, we are living with a whole lie. And so Matthew is doing this incredible work to get everybody uh, back in, on the same page, understanding who Jesus was in fulfillment of the prophecies and preparing their heart to receive him um, through the teaching. He's setting up a platform, uh, giving the weight to everything that would come after this. Thus he says, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. And he may have meant many things by that, but what I think he ultimately meant was at just the right time, at the perfect preordained time, uh, the father sent his son, conceived in the womb by Mary, by the Holy Spirit, to be born, to live, to exist, to teach, to minister, to perform wonderful and powerful acts, all good acts, all for the purpose of kindness and mercy and love, to die on the cross for our sins, to go into heaven, and now to come back down by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring this word, this revelation, um, to each and every one of us. My goal for us as we get into this series, and don't worry, it won't be like today very much. It'll be more like what I typically teach But my goal is for us to learn through the teaching of Jesus, through this lens of the coming of the kingdom of heaven, um, how to live, how to think, how to feel, how to perceive, how to see, how to align our lives like David did, like Jesus did, like all of us that are now filled with the Holy Spirit, to the will and to the pleasure and to the kingdom of heaven so that we might not only see the kingdom of heaven through the teaching of Jesus and his life, and that we not, might not only perceive the coming of the kingdom of heaven through Jesus and his teaching and his life, but by the power of the Holy Spirit that emanates off these words, that we might obey these words, that, and we might experience the power of its coming. We had a great time together last week in the presence of God where we experienced just a small taste of the power of his coming. And my goal is for us to get a big taste through the teaching of this word. And I know it's written for a Jewish audience, but I think I've proven well that that includes me and you when we bow, when we submit to, and when we worship the Jewish Messiah. I want us to prepare our hearts for what's coming next in the days ahead through our teaching and otherwise. And I think one great way to do that is through the, the sacrament, through, the, through communion, through Holy Communion. So I want us to receive communion today. Uh, The communion is is very simple. Um, It's sacramental. It's instituted by scripture. It's something that the Holy Spirit abides in. It's something that draws us very, very near to God. Uh, But basically, the the bread is symbolic of the body of Christ, and the cup is symbolic of the blood of Jesus Christ. And in, in, in some traditions, they would say that as the priest or the pastor or whoever prays over the elements, they literally, they transubstantiate and they literally become the body and blood of Christ mysteriously to us through that prayer. I don't believe that that is true. You will not be eating a body or blood today. But I do believe that spiritually, as we, if we receive these things by faith, um, we are receiving the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and it ushers in the Holy Spirit. When we receive the elements, basically we're saying that we believe. We believe Jesus is the one and only Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, as I just said, the perfect human sacrifice, and that he didn't just die for the sins of the world, he died for my sins too. And I believe that as I receive these elements symbolizing what he gave on my behalf, I'm I'm humbly receiving that sacrifice. I'm giving my life to the one who gave his life to me, I believe that as we receive these elements, that they are mingled with the Holy Spirit, and it's as if we receive the Holy Spirit as well, and we receive at least the beginning, the seeds of, the remedy that they were given um, to create within us. I believe that there is the capacity for mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual healing as we receive these elements with faith and allow God to flood our bodies and to flood our lives. I also believe that it can clean up our mind and our heart to to a point that it can sanctify us to a degree that we become more sensitive to the Holy Spirit, better able to perceive the things of God. We pastors work really hard to be pithy, which I'm not. We try really hard to be clever and to be funny from time to time to keep you interested. 
We search through the scriptures and sometimes we won't go to the deepest and most difficult and complicated places because we know our audience doesn't have the attention span to get there. But I like to try to remind myself that the spirit in me that gives me insight during the week is also the spirit in you. And if I minister to that spirit in you, then perhaps you'll have the ability to pay attention, to dig in, to dive in, to open your heart to the truths of God in a way that is supernatural. In other words, this isn't just another guy speaking and doing, you know, a, 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 a get better seminar in a fleshy way. This is, this is a sacramental place. This is a wonderful place. This is a spiritual place. And so I think communion has the capacity um, to prepare our hearts for a deeper time in the presence of God. And as we begin this sermon series, um, that's exactly how I would like for us to receive it today. You may wonder if you're qualified. You may say, I'm not a member of this church. It doesn't matter. You are a member of the church if Jesus Christ is your savior and you follow him as Lord, even as imperfectly as we do. You may say, I'm not sure I've received the right baptism, that I have the right paperwork to receive communion in your church. If you believe that Jesus is the one and only son of God and that he gave his life on the cross for you, then you are qualified to receive this communion. Maybe you just are beginning to believe it right here, right now, today. Well, as you receive these elements, make this the moment that you actually receive Christ. As you receive the body through the bread and the blood through the cup and the Holy Spirit through the whole experience, this could be your conversion moment. There is absolutely uh, no religious bar that you need to get over. You just simply need to believe. This is an open communion, open to everyone, to anyone uh, who believes. Let's pray. 